our panel is human sides of open data or data. Uh, should be open data, sorry, I missed that. Bridging digital humanities and public interest tech. Uh, so in terms of our agenda, we're gonna spend a little time just giving some introductions about ourselves, um, our own backgrounds, how we kind of came to this work and this aspect of digital scholarship and digital skills. Um, give a little more background about the Grad Center and digital initiatives, uh, digital humanities and public interest tech. Um, a little more on our personal journeys and then just kind of talk through some different projects, all of which involve various kinds of open data or data about NYC, in some cases instances of mixing or blending data that is open and closed. Have a little time for discussion and then any kind of open Q&A after that. Um, and we'll be happy to share the slides as well. Uh, so first, um, I'm Ian Williams. I'm a third year PhD student in the doctoral program in social welfare at the CUNY Graduate Center. I'm a social worker by professional training. Um, I came into this stuff by being interested in technology adoption in human services, uh, and then going much further into the rabbit hole of the digital world. Sam? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Sam. Uh, I'm a student in the English department at the CUNY Graduate Center, and um, like Rebecca, I'm also a uh, digital fellow at the Graduate Center digital initiatives, um, and uh, I was asked by Ian to, to join on this panel uh, to talk about uh, modeling a little bit and using data uh, to support that work. Uh, really pleased to be here. Yeah. Hi, I'll stand up so you guys can see me back. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca. Um, like uh, Ian and, and Sam, I'm a doctoral candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center. My um, uh, field is political science. I work a lot with open data. Um, I'm excited to show you guys some of the projects that I did with the uh, New York City Districting Commission last year with the testimony that was submitted um, in response to the maps that were redrawn. Um, like Sam, I'm a digital fellow at the CUNY um, uh, Graduate Center in Digital Initiatives. And what that means is that we're part of a group of students um, who help uh, the Graduate Center community with digital projects. So that can be include teaching uh, workshops in Python and R and some more fun workshops like Sam's going to show you guys some 3D printing models using open data um, and uh, and then also just helping people figure out how to use a website like more some more uh, basic digital skills as well um, but we're really that's what we love to do just help people get on their way with something that's digitally oriented and we're, we're excited for this panel Right. And you're probably wondering, what's that program social media fellow? So my job is that I manage social media and communications for my program, but also I like to pitch other people's work, you know, help them help it show off all the cool stuff that they do. Um, so I want to talk a little more about the Grad Center Digital Initiative Center. Do you want to take this one? Because I feel like you're a good spokesperson for the CDI. I think Rebecca did as good a job as can be expected. Right. I'm just curious, out of interest, um, how many of you are currently involved in higher education? So at least a couple of you. Okay. Other you in government, nonprofit, private sector. Okay. Government. Okay. Great. Right. Great. Um, and how many of you use digital tools in your work in general? Okay. So quite a few. Okay. Great. So this will be a really interesting. It'll be a, a great way for us to share how we use digital tools to do to work with open data. Um, that's exciting to know. Yeah. I guess I will just say about the digital initiatives that kind of predates the current AI wave and like wave of funding. So you may have heard that the CUNY Graduate Center is going to be part of the Empire AI initiative and like the governor's sort of $400 million plan. The data service for that are actually all going to be based out of uh, SUNY Buffalo. Um, but the Simons Foundation has committed $75 million to CUNY. That's a separate project and initiative. There'll be some interactions, but the digital initiatives comes out of, I think it was like the early 2000s. So a lot of it was funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm um, really coming out of digital humanists pioneering and trying to like cultivate all of these things. But the Grad Center does have a master's degree. Yeah, in I'll add one point then. So just to contextualize this. So typical PhD program, maybe at other universities like NYU, you might just get funding to write your, to do your work. There might not be any service obligations, right? The typical graduate center PhD student has to do um, has to do some kind of work alongside their their studies in order to essentially to pay for the program. So um, the typical GC student uh, teaches maybe a section or two, or as a research assistant, 
Um, GCDI um, is paid for by the provost's office, which means um, they offer money really to replace our students' obligations uh, in that area to instead do digital work. So instead of teaching or research it, to being a research assistant or professor, uh, like Rebecca said, we do workshops, we reach out to the community, uh, and we help deliver largely open source uh, educational opportunities uh, for students on campus, as well as professors sometimes. Yeah. And also platforms and resources, like there's a, a WordPress instance called the CUNY Academic Commons that's used as a kind of free hosting site for a lot of educational resources. There are other tools like Manifold is a publishing resource that is open. So the different ideas, I guess, of open information and data that maybe are beyond what we might think of when we consider like municipal or administrative data. Um, so one of the things we wanted to kind of talk about with this uh, panel and just kind of open up this discussion is like, I think introducing a little bit of the background and the idea of the digital humanities, but also how it's converging with the discourse on public interest technology and how that tends to look in higher education and universities. Um, so like digital humanities actually started in the 1940s, uh, people kind of dabbling with learning new, uh, sorry, uh, like learning new ways and new methods like use computational tools um, to analyze humanities text, but also do humanities means. So it's a much older history. And I think it's kind of surprising to consider it. Like people have been playing and dabbling and creating for a very long time. But it's also a kind of a heterogeneous field where there's a lot of different debates. There's this series that Matt Gold, who is the director of the digital initiatives and a professor of English at CUNY, uh, he edits every year called the Debates in the Digital Humanities, which you can actually read it free online. Um, but they're really interesting essays and they come out of here. Um, and public interest technology as an academic field, I mean, there's a lot of discourse and use of that, but it is a much more recent thing, even though it kind of started in the 90s, really with the origins of the internet um, and thinking about like the public good of information and using new information tech for that purpose. Uh, the New America Foundation funds a lot of the projects at universities and that's really in the US. So I think every state has at least one designee. Uh, CUNY has one. It's actually based out of the College of Staten Island. Um, there's a public interest tech bachelor's degree uh, and a pit lab at CSI St. George. And so these things kind of coexist and sometimes they interact and sometimes they don't. Um, but again, just lots of interesting activities around tech, uh, creativity, expressions of humanity, um, and trying to think about the public good in higher ed. So just in terms of the academic thing, this is just like some very rudimentary data analysis that I did the other day, mm -hmm. just looking on Google Scholar to see some search results. I couldn't figure out a way to export the data. I don't have the programming skills to make fancy graphs right on the spot, nor to quite figure out how to get ChatGPT to do it for me. Um, but it was interesting to consider like, okay, so just what are the results for these fields and where does open data fit within this in terms of, because they often operate in very different disciplines, but you can see in this loose form, right? Like public interest technology is a relatively new term and field, so there's relatively few articles. But if you start combining queries and concepts, it gets even more interesting, particularly the intersections of digital humanities and public interest technology or digital humanities, public interest technology, and open data, where there's only two academic articles. Now, there's probably other things, blogs, websites, you know, other kinds of discourse uh, that are not in this, but in terms of like the scholarship, this just seemed very interesting as a way of laying out the landscape. Um, so I think something to go back to GCDI, uh, and I think we can all kind of speak to this, like a lot of it is just there's this continuous process of experimentation, uh, dabbling, playing around with data, making things, making projects, using it in teaching, using it in more public service projects or scholarship, which we'll talk a bit more in detail. Can you define digital humanities and what exactly it is? Yeah. So it really comes down to using Using computers and digital technologies um, with a humanities lens, so that might be like analyzing texts or even like classical texts with computers, but it might also be exploring 
the digital. So say like new technologies or data from humanistic questions and inquiries, which might not just be like, how can I do good? How can I solve this problem? But like, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean to be human or to have humanistic values in a world of technology? Yeah, I mean, digital humanities, it's a, I think it's largely it to be an academic field, right? I don't know how well used it is outside of higher education, but you will, there, there are calls now for professors in the field of digital humanities. And these are people who are, are basing their research off the origins of doing things like uh, counting how frequently a certain word appeared in a text, because at some point in the development of analysis and looking at texts, somebody said, hey, how many times does the word love show up in you know, this, set, this set of novels that we have in front of us? And thus began the, for example, this is an example of where the part this began, the, the tradition of distant reading. You know, you, those of you who've taken like a 200 level English course, it's like you should close read, you should analyze what the word rose means or something like that. Uh, they, the the tongue in cheek remark, uh, <coughs> distant reading uh, implies that you might take a corpus of 100 novels and see how, how many times does a certain word show up. And, and it's those kinds of, uh, a computational approach uh, to, a, to a typically humanistic uh, uh, domain uh, that gave rise to the field. But as Ian said, um, that also developed into questions of well, what is tech doing to um, to inquiry in that field, to sorry, to the humanities and the social sciences, um, and what is that telling us about how we are now living humane lives, becoming speakers, becoming readers, becoming thinkers? Right? How has that changed? It was a long time ago. Um, being a being a scholar in the social sciences and the humanities meant just poring over a number, you know, a very large number of physical books, and that's just not the case anymore. Yeah, yeah and, and I, I would add to that there. You might also see an example of digital humanities with uh, now um, a digital archives. So you know, um, anything that used to exist as a, uh, a physical <coughs> archive oftentimes has now become digitized. That becomes a digital archive. So that's also within the realm of digital humanities. Um, but just on the note of text analysis, so really being able to computationally um, uh, read or have a co computer basically read text for you and highlight a specific word. I'm going to show an example um, of um, a program that I use called Named Entity Recognition that basically scans text and decides whether a word can be categorized as an organization or as a person or as a place. And it, it gives you an opportunity to uh, to get through a huge amount of text and get information about that text in a very quick way once you have the skills under your belt. Um, but there are huge problems with that, as I'm gonna show in my, um, in my example too. The, this doesn't mean that the researcher is not involved. There's the, the, these computer models, makes, like they make errors co constantly. One of the tools that I like to use in my analysis are I thought I wanted to use, I'll just say that, one of the tools I thought I wanted to use for my dissertation was sentiment analysis. Basically, it's a process of um, uh, having the computer tell you whether a piece of text is positive, neutral, or negative. And it's just always wrong. I mean, it's, I, mean I, I did a, I, uh, you know, sampling, taking a sample of my larger data, I wanted to work with data from Twitter, I guess X now, previously Twitter, and from Reddit, and just by scanning a very small, like a, a, a small portion of my data set, I think it was 75% inaccurate. I mean, that's a huge problem. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's, so there's a lot of excitement, I think, for these digital tools, but I think it's just important to, re to remember that it doesn't mean that the researcher is not involved and that you, ha that the um, results are infallible. Um, and of course, they're all, huge amounts of like ethical considerations about how these models are trained and um, that, that gets into a much larger dimension. But that's sort of like the, the wheelhouse of digital humanities. Uh, you know, I'm a social scientist, so I don't really fall within the bucket of digital humanities. We call it computational social science, but it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. That's funny because my undergraduate was in the humanities and then I'm a social worker and in a, so like I'm in a social science program, but for me, kind of really engaging with the digital was by encountering the digital humanities community at the Graduate Center. Yeah, yeah which I think is the other piece, right? It's like, you know, GCDI, because it's such a center for this school, it's really infused with this very different approach that I think also reflects CUNY's values and CUNY's mission as a public school and a public good. Um, and, you know, larger questions about the humanities, like, there's always these discussions about humanities programs getting cut or you know what is the value of them 
Um, but a lot of people who go through DH programs, you know, they end up working in tech or as technical writers, you know, often like project management roles because there's a really good combination of a degree of understanding how different technologies and tools work and how they don't work and how people work. And also how to communicate about them. Yes, yeah. that's a huge part. So this is just a, you've probably been wondering, what is this? Mm -hmm. I put this together late last night, uh, thinking about the journey of coming here, and why we're here, why we uh, decided to put together this panel, um, why my colleagues so generously agreed to sign up for this thing. What is this? So last year, I came to NYC School of Data because my wife, Melissa, who's sitting here, was like, oh, you should come check this out. I was taking a class in interactive data visualization in D3, which is really hard, still don't really get it, um, and reading a lot about the politics of data and digital knowledge. Um, I am definitely a like more qualitative style of researcher. I tend to think about things in social context, but also I was like going to these public interest technology conferences. I worked at one at CUNY in 2022, went to another one in 2023. Um, which was kind of emerging and coexisting, but again, sometimes these worlds weren't necessarily happening. You know, I'm also, because I'm a social worker, I'm involved in social work research around technology. There's all these different things that are just kind of there and not a member of the Haystack Collaboratory. It's a Humanities, Arts, Sciences Alliance and Collaboratory, which started in the early 2000s. That's another like digital humanities thing. Uh, went to a couple of other conferences, actually went to DEF CON last year, which is a hacker convention. There's a friend of mine uh, who is a computer science researcher is like involved in security testing for large language models. And that was like a really interesting trip as someone who is not in that world. But it kind of led to thinking, well, why not bring some of this into the School of Data? Because so I went last year, I had a great time. It was really interesting. But there is that question, like, what are the humanities? What are the DH? Like, what are these? other questions about data, about what the assumptions about what can be known or not, or what can be done with data. I thought, well, what better way than bring along some colleagues and just showcase some of our projects and then have a discussion about them, uh, see what kind of seems interesting or sticks. So first, I want to talk a few about a couple of projects, uh, teaching and just some classwork stuff. Um, like I said, we had a couple of pivots, so I just threw together a little more than I thought I would. First thing is that inspired by coming to School of Data last year, I taught a class at Hunter College at the Silverman School of Social Work over the summer, and it was about homelessness and social policy. And I have taught like other policy classes. There's very little about like data literacy. You know, there's a lot of discourse about the ways in which policies inform data systems, and students work with them all the time because social workers are collecting and interpreting data all the time. You know, or they're responding to something um, that is represented at the policymaker level or the institutional level or to the public as data points, usually visualized. So I had students go to um, just a basic orientation to NYC Open Data, coincided with the class, um, and then had them explore, you know, 311 queries about either homeless encampments or homeless person assistance, and just kind of look at that to imagine as they're reading you know, about the political economy of housing, as they're reading about the policy history and the service infrastructure, like you know, some accounts that are a bit more, I think, sympathetic and some which were much more critical and much more like an advocates are kind of thinking about the social justice perspective, like how do we manage and respond to the problem of homelessness, which is a perpetual problem of our modern time and is very different now than it was, say, before the late 70s and the kind of economic transformations and housing crises at that time. Um, so it was just a way of incorporating and taking back from this. Um, and it was interesting the results that student had, the students had. I tried to take a screenshot from uh, uh, Google Jamboard, which is being lined down. It was kind of hard to get the export right, so it's a little jam jumbled. But just interesting seeing what people's responses were. Um, at the end of the class, some of the students told me that the class was way too focused on tech bro stuff and data stuff. <laughs> but I also had one student who told me, I'm really concerned because now I can look up like my parking tickets. I didn't know that this was here and I didn't know this was searchable. So like infusing that digital literacy and then seeing how people run with it um, and how they do it. I mean, I learned a lot about how to structure it more into the assignments. 
but the best way to do it was just for this, for this first level, was like have them play, then ask them to write a reflection, um, and then write a journal about it, and think about how they might use this in the work or not, or where they imagine themselves responding to in this continuum of data. Another example, took a basic JavaScript class. Should have taken that before the D3 class, but I took it in the fall. Um, and the end result of that was that we had to take a set of open data and make a map of some kind using Leaflet. So I took the data set on DCLA's cultural organizations, which is interestingly just kind of arranged this way. There's not really a clear explanation of the taxonomy, um, and just make a basic map. And it was fun and interesting. It took a little while. This stuff is not easy, but it was a cool example. Again, I'm just like, how are we incorporating this into our learning? Um, the actual lessons as well for the JavaScript is a really good uh, curriculum. It's developed by Steve Zweibel, who's a digital scholarship librarian and also a member of the GCDI. Um, and the third thing is that one of the other pieces that comes out of the Grad Center Digital Initiatives is that we have a digital research institute that is open in the winter break to grad students at the GC across all disciplines. Um, they have to apply, they have to express some interest, um, but it's kind of a walkthrough of all the fundamentals, starting with the command line and data literacy, all the way through text analysis and simulations in Python. Um, so Rebecca and I worked on this year's one where we also developed and launched a website that was funded through the National Endowment for the Humanities, all of which is available online, all of which is open source. People can either use the existing things or fork it on GitHub and make their own version. And I'll just say, if you're interested in learning how to code in Python or R, um, but you come from a more humanities background, or I'd say you don't have a technical background, and this is a great resource to get started with because it's really written in a very accessible way. I mean, we, we do it for, I'll just say like, that I attended the DRI in 2021 and it changed my life. I had a zero, a zero technical background prior to doing this and the, it was great to attend, obviously, but I had done the, the curriculum prior to it just to get myself going and I did it like four or five times after just with the, the asynchronous online and it's, it's amazing how, like what a foundation this gives and how the language is just so accessible. I mean, it's not written in this like coder, you, you know, computer science way, which is great for some folks. It just wasn't accessible to me. And so I highly recommend you guys check this out if you're interested in sort of getting a jump start on in encoding. Yeah, it was similarly transformational for me. I was taking a, a year long statistics class when I took it in 2022. And you know, it was a very comprehensive class. It was taught by an organizational psychologist. We were learning R, we were using DataCamp. So it was all like advanced, but it was very fast. And there was a lot that was assumed, and like I was amazed by the way that this approached. Now, I think really from a student-centered idea of pedagogy, from an idea that adult learners have very different needs, and that people actually teach themselves over time. But a lot of the like language of tech education, even of like the discourse of boot camps, sort of like, oh, it's going to be easy. Oh, you can be like, you know, a super hacker, prompt engineer, coding ninja. Like that scares people off because what happens when? something doesn't work because it, it's frustrating coding. Like, I don't like coding, I'll be totally honest. I was happy to do the HTML stuff because that's much more fun for me, but also very essential to the world today because we wouldn't have the internet without it. Um, so with that, I'm gonna get over to Rebecca. Yeah. So I am gonna tell you a little bit about a project that I worked on um, all of last year. So as I'm sure most of you know, um, every 10 years in the US, there's a census count, and following a census count, there are all sorts of um, redistricting processes that occur at a state level and then also at a local level. Um, and so New York City went through a whole redistricting process last year, um, and part of that process is um, there, the city receives testimonial from residents about how they would like their, their districts to remain or maybe change. Maybe they want to merge with a community that's next to them but has been part of a different district in the last 10 years. Um, and actually, in this past cycle, the New York City Districting Commission received a, an unprecedented, I can't believe I'm saying the word unprecedented, it drives me crazy, but uh, they never received this many testimonials um, in part because uh, 
now email communications is just everyone uses it even more so than even a decade ago. It's just become so easy to email. Um, and um, so they received 13,000, over 13,000 um, oral, electronic, and hard co copy testimony. Um, and it's all text. It's all text information. And um, I'm sh some of you work in government, so you know how resource-strapped uh, 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 agencies can be, and especially, you know, something like the Districting Commission is a, um, a temporary uh, agency, you know, that really kind of gets going every 10 years. Um, so I was part of the... Um, uh, CUNY Center for Urban Research, and they were um, contracted by the, the Districting Commission to do all kinds of analysis. I mean, this is it, this is a huge CUNY initiative. It was engaging folks across campuses. I had a, a smaller portion of that project, um, which was really to help use digital tools to make parsing through the information in this text easier. Um, and. Uh, following that little project, um, I actually got more funding to really help me pull this together. And so I'll just show I got funding from uh, the CUNY Library and the um, the GCDI. We've mentioned quite a bit, um, and I worked with a team of five students. Um, I led the team. We were a mix of uh, doctoral students and master students. So I want to start by um, showing you first what does the data look like on the New York City Districting Commission website, and then I'm gonna explain my, the process of how we went from these PDF files uh, online to a uh, database, so a spreadsheet, that is organized by um, location, ethnicity, language spoken, um, uh, parks, like different, like different things that maybe a researcher or other folks who want to understand the information that was in these files could easily parse through and figure out, okay, I want to learn more about, uh, you know, what's going on in Flatbush. Oh, now I know if I go to these, I, now I know which files to go look for that information, right? So just making it uh, a simpler process. All right, so this is the the New York City Districting Commission website, and they have testimonials sort of organized by um, uh, borough, but and here are some that were submitted by council members, and but then you get like individuals, and they're just put in these like files by dates. It's very hard to understand, like to really, if you wanted to do research on the district on these testimonials it would just take a gargantuan effort to just navigate through it, right? So even though this is considered open data, and I do commend the New York City for making these files available, it's not a usable format. Um, it's very, very hard to really understand what people were saying. And this is an issue that the folks at the Districted Commission were facing because they have to read these and then categorize them. So um, let me go first to database. That was hard with the Zoom thing to... Maybe I have it linked here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, but I can't access the top bar over here. Okay, so it takes a little moment to load the database. So I'm going to explain the process before, and then we'll show you what it actually looks like. So I use a digital tool called Named Entity Recognition. And it, that's a, it's actually that's considered a machine learning process. And all that really means is that humans train, it's a human trained, um, it, it, humans marked the data that trained the machine, okay? So, uh, and it's actually, named entity, entity recognition is something that grew out of our, um, uh, the military, um, I can't remember exactly the name of the agency in the military that develops these products, but it's the same mil a, a division that, what is it? DARPA, DARPA exactly, DARPA. Um, and part of the reason they developed it is that, you know, they want to be able to scan large amounts of information and categorize it into big categories. So we, in, in um, named entity recognition specifically can categorize things by location, people, identities, laws, events, organizations. So um, it's a really useful tool if you have a large amount of text and you just want to know what's in it. So we had to first um, 
take the PDF files from the New York City Distribution Commission website. To do that, we did a process called web scraping. Um, so web scraping is really the process of um, automating the copying and pasting of information from the internet. So uh, it, you have to go through the HTML code in order to be able to know exactly which part of the web page you want to collect. In this case, we wanted to collect every single PDF file that was saved on the New York City Districting Commission web page. Um, and uh, once we had those files, we had to convert them into a plain text file. It's just that in order, the reason we did that is because uh, computer programs are, when you, let me take this back. A PDF file it has, um, is a processed text file. It has a lot of information in addition to the text that makes it uh, static in the way that we receive a PDF, right? So that information is not, is going to interfere with um, just collecting the raw text. So we had to convert it first into plain text and then we ran this named entity recognition process. Um, so I'll show you guys what the entity, uh, what basically what it does for you is it finds, it, it tags a word with a code. So in this case we see it says GPE and then it's gonna tell you which was the entity identified. So in this case, Ar Arochar is a neighborhood um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and so that's why it's tagged as a GPE. If I scroll down a little bit, I'll show you guys a different tag. So here, um, NORP is usually a nationality, but it can also be a religion. It can also be a political affiliation. It's really all about identity. Um, so we were also looking for that. Um, uh, org is for an organization. Um, FAC is also a location-based um, uh, tag, but it's really pointing out like a particular building as opposed to like a geographic region. Um, so as you can see, like we went through all of this amount of text and then it, you, it looks like it quickly identified all these organizations and the name, the proper names of everything, but this is really a very cleaned version of this process. We actually had data, I mean, you know, something that would say NORP, so looking for a nationality, but actually uh, linking to something that had nothing to do with that, right? So there's the, the, the bulk of our work for this uh, project was data cleaning. It took us six weeks to clean the data. Um, but once we got the data cleaned, what we were able to do is, um, you know, put together this, this database. We then also added additional layers of data. So we wanted to be able to point uh, folks to which PDF page, like which PDF file this information is located in. So that's the file name. And then there's a link to a Dropbox um, a, a folder where that file lives. So you can go see it there. Um, the weight means how many times, okay, so there oftentimes with these testi testimonials, there were um, templates that people use. So maybe a particular community was very organized and had, you know, just had people sign a template. So we only included one instance of that template, but then we would give it a weight. So for example, this, this one came up six times, right? So that's why we have a weight. You can kind of see you know, how important or how often this, this um, particular uh, file showed up. Um, this, these were identified by the model, but then we added additional layers. Let me see if I can scroll here and go back up. Oops, it's too far. Okay. Those yeah, I'm gonna show you guys at the top what all this means, but um, so, let's see if I can go back up here. It's a little bit harder to navigate here. Okay, so we then decided we, for anything that's a neighborhood in New York City, we wanted to make sure to also include what council district it was in. Um, and then also uh, we added the, um, the polygon. So basically this would be for anyone who wanted to then map where the information came from, and that's something that we did. I'm going to show you guys a map of the political distribution, or basically, really where uh, the majority of um, these testimonials came from, right? So, so really, we, we we went from this to this database that 
um, many scholars are now using to be able to do all kinds of analyses about uh, the redistricting process um, in New York City. Um, some folks are really interested in discourse. What I found really interesting going through uh, these testimonial files was just how different communities, um, the, the kind of language that they use to communicate with government. Um, I don't mean to single out any neighborhood, but there were certain neighborhoods in Manhattan who took on a tone that was more entitled, you know, were entitled to be in this district. And then other communities um, in Queens who are much more of a, please let us be in a community with this other district. I, it's really not to single out. It's just, it's interesting to see how, um, yeah, just how discourse happens and how conversations happen um, between um, different communities and how they relate to government. Um, so, you know, this, this creates many opportunities for, for, for researchers. Um, and when we took, my team and I took the opportunity to use our database to now do, create a map about um, uh, looking at political power in New York City. And, uh-oh, what happened here? I guess. Um, okay, I, I guess felt in the last night decided to, maybe I can go see it over here. Um, all right, that's too bad. Oh yeah, maybe if I log in. Um, but unfortunately, I don't remember my computer log in. I will send this out. We will, if we can share our slides, I will send it out. But it was, we, we were able to then map uh, where the, um, which community submitted the highest number of testimonials. Uh, it's not to say that these are the communities that are most organized just generally. It's the, com the communities that were mo most at risk of maybe losing power or being put in a district that was a different district that they were before were more likely to respond. So part of the reason why, for example, the Upper East Side was very active um, was that there was a proposal to lump them in with a, a, um, a district in Queens, and if they, you know, they felt like their needs were different from communities in Queens. So you're, so you see a lot of responses from there. And then in um, South Brooklyn, um, the Sunset Park community was very active in wanting to uh, create the largest Asian uh, New York-based um, uh, district, and they were very, very organized and submitted a huge number of um, testimonials, which is uh, really exciting. Um, and so it's just it was interesting to be able to map that, and without creating this database, that would have been impossible. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop here and happy to take some questions about this process. Um, I'll, just, I'll just say one more time, like, I wouldn't have been able to do this work had I not attended the Digital Research Institute and used that website that we shared with you. I had, three years ago, had never touched Python, and within uh, a year I was able to do a, pro a, pro um, a project like this. It obviously took a lot of like self-learning, but I was very committed, and it's just really amazing what you can do once you kind of uh, open your mind to thinking that, like, first of all, you just have to be really open to troubleshooting. That's like number one game of coding. Um, but it's just that we're, I think we're all capable of doing this if we have, if we have a, if you have a project in mind and a goal that you want to work towards, you'll find the tools to get there. Um, just my little spiel. Um, all right, I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Yes, go ahead. Um, how did you actually run the name data acquisition? Like, how do you get access to so it's that's a great question. Okay, so I I work in Python and Python is an open you know it's, it's a free open source language and named entity recognition is also an open source model. I use there there are many of them out there so you can search for named entity recognition. I use the Spacey one. Um, it's very easy to use. I'm happy to share resources for how how to go about it. Um, but it's it's free. It's a free tool. Um, really, the, the barrier to entry is just learning how to use it. Um, but that's another reason why I'm really big on, uh, especially um, folks who are either scholars or in public interest work, I really, really highly recommend learning how to code because then you have access to all these tools that are open source and free as opposed to, you know, learning how to use a proprietary um, uh, tool like, let's say, Stata, that you're you're inherently limited once you leave an institution that pays for the, the license, I mean, unless you have unlimited funds yourself, but most people don't. Um, so uh, once you know how to code in Python, the world of text analysis, including name entity recognition, just is at your fingertips. 
Yes, go ahead. Um, so, in 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 the lieu of like digital humanities, these these text text recognition tools, how how far do you think they are with the objectivity they have in dealing with like cultural identities or like other social intricacies of people that whose feedback you're analyzing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the short answer is that they're very far from it. And I mean, named entity recognition is very much word-based. I, 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 it's not so much that it has a, a bias, it's just that it's either correct or incorrect in um, understanding whether something is actually what it's saying it, it is. But in the larger world of specific, specifically AI, but most algorithms are really like built with a lot of biases baked into them, in part because humans built these models and were all filled with biases. Um, I was just listening on the news the other day about, um, uh, I can't remember which of the big tech cor companies, but they, they tried to overcorrect for the biases and like make it very, very, um, I don't know, I, I don't, like very, very progressive and it went the complete opposite direction where it was also completely wrong. Um, so I just, um, I, I think all our tech tools are inherently flawed, and it, in part because humans are inherently flawed, and uh, it's going to take a very long time, I think, for you know the folks who are building these models to get it right. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of in that vein, I was curious about what you were talking about with the like discourse side of this, mm -hmm. and um, you mentioned earlier um, a system that you use that was supposed to be able to pick up tonality. And I was wondering, like, in the hypothetical that that system works, <laughs> um, like, what the potentials for a project like this are, and if you had ever thought about um, a next step. Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, if the sentiment analysis tool that I wanted to use for my dissertation worked, my the, really what's what's amazing about it is that you can you can capture the temperature in the room, so to speak, about a particular topic. So it's, this, it's especially especially helpful when you're looking at social media data because if it actually worked, you could you know, follow one particular hashtag around a particular time period and say, uh, you know, this many people thought positively about it and this many people thought negatively about it. If it were that simple, it would be a wonderful tool. Um, unfortunately, it, it's not, doesn't work that way. For a project like this, like I was hoping to be able to use something like a sentiment analysis. Um, it wouldn't capture like the nuances in the discourse, but it would be able to say whether people were pretty positive or negative. But the truth is, if you're writing a testimonial, you're probably writing into complaints. So my hypothesis would have been it's a little bit, uh, and, and for good reason. This is why we have these testimonials, right? You should be able to express your views, and but generally speaking, it's because you're not happy with what's being decided for you. Um, and um, but so I think actually for a, a project like this, I want to do a more granular search for specific keywords that would indicate um, the kinds of language people are using, uh, what what kinds of uh, word like uh, keyword frequencies by community, what what were the words they use mo you know most often. Um, there there is an awesome tool in uh, text analysis um, that helps you look for one word and see the context in which it's used across different texts. So like we were saying the word love, for example, one of the most prime examples of this, like looking at love in Moby Dick versus love in um, Pride and Prejudice, and they have like completely different contexts, like different kinds of words associations with it. So that would be one other application of this. Um, I should say, I teach a whole semester class on text analysis. If any of you are interested in, in text analysis, I'm happy to share my syllabus. It's full of resources. It's designed for beginners, and it's designed, I mean, something that I teach in person, but it's really anyone could just like hop on and, and and try their hands at it. So, um, and, I, I, and I offer plenty of examples of projects beyond my own um, of, you know, how to use text analysis in a, it's a policy oriented class. So really specifically for how policymakers might use tools like this um, in their work. Question yeah. Do you have your syllabus online anywhere? Yeah, I do. It's on, it's on GitHub. So I'll, I'll link to it somehow, hopefully get it to you guys. But yeah, it's on, it's on GitHub. Yes. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. It's super interesting. I'm curious about um, like how generative the NER stuff is, and like, do you develop a coding scheme to look for specific keywords, or does it sort of like explore in order to find a scheme that you know represents the text one way or another? This is a really good question. So the NER is is trained on a particular set of texts, and it's going to use that knowledge to study your own text. Now, that being said, you can train the NER model to do to find words that you're interested in. So one of this one of my students in my class this semester, she specifically um, uh, researches alt right conversations, and the NER model that I use in this program that I taught her how to use does not. Um, is not capable of identifying specific people in the alt-right um, world, specific organizations, language that's being used. So it's not it's not trained properly. So she's actually going through a whole process right now of training the model so that it works for her own purposes. So there, there and um, I would say I don't want to say it's easy, but once you're able to do something like named entity recognition, you are capable of then finding the resources to to um, work on your own. So to, to like build your own named entity recognition model. It, it's, it sound, I'm making it sound like anyone can do it. I really believe anyone can do it. I think if I'm able to do this work, anyone can. Not to deprecate myself, but I don't, I don't have a technical background. This felt so inaccessible. But I really believe that if you have a problem you're trying to solve, you will, you're going to be determined to get there. Um, but it, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. But these are, it's, an imperf it's imperfect. And, but there are ways to make it better for your purposes. Yeah. I think I got it. I'll take one more question. I'm going to pass it on to Sam. Um, I was actually wondering if you ever read like academic papers written from like CS backgrounds. Um, and they, and I say this because I went to, <laughs> I, I did a tech degree. And I know a lot of the times when we're taught, we're not thinking a lot about the social um, humanity side of it. And when you look at those papers, what lens do you look at it from? And then, like, do you see like a lot of things that are missing? Um, yeah, just just wondering. That's also a really great question. I'll, I'll con uh, confess that. Uh, I have tried to read computer science papers, but oftentimes it just I get lost after the intro. It's it you know that's academia is very technical, and if you're not in your field or in a sort of adjacent field, it, it can get really hard. Um, I do read I have read um, uh, computer science papers by folks who are creating these models. So for example, the folks who developed the sentiment analysis model that I use, they're they're computer scientists, but they have um, uh, a disposition towards discourse, right? And so, um, you know, that's natural language processing. So I, I'm, I'm curious to know sort of what the process was in building the model. But again, like I'm limited in my ability to really understand the sort of crux of it all. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. I'm passing on to Sam. Hi everybody, uh, uh, my name is Sam um, and I am presenting something which is not related to my dissertation research at all. This was like a break from something that I uh, am otherwise looking at which is mostly poetry in the 20th century. It's, I decided to call it partially open modeling because uh, what I'm actually doing here was only partly informed by open data and open source methods and, and resources. And um, what I am showing you is an attempt to visualize, or a, or a way of visualizing, uh, classic architecture and natural landscapes. So to the extent, the way in which it would fit into a digital humanities uh, scope is that you, could, you can use these methods uh, to provide new kinds of visualizations for classic architecture, classic buildings, um, and also natural landscapes that are mentioned in, in, in texts, right? I'm thinking for some reason of Thoreau's Walden right now, if any of you uh, know about that particular location. Uh, up in Concord, Massachusetts, if I remember rightly. Um, the first of the four slides I'm going to show you here is an attempt to recreate uh, the very college building that we're currently based in, which is the Graduate Center for the CUNY system at 365 Fifth Avenue. This is a photo from Google Maps, uh, Google Street View, of course, and this is a photo, a screenshot from NYC Open Data's, uh, or the city, the city of New York's um, page where they provide a 3D model of um, the city of New York, um, broken up by, uh, by community districts. Um, so this, that's just the sort of front page image they have. Down here, you can actually see how the model 
shows up in Rhino. Rhino is not open source or free. Um, I use the free trial to actually produce this. Um, but um, it's what apparently what the, it was the New York City's Department of IT and Telecoms did an aerial survey of the roof structures of the whole city uh, and puts it very nicely. I, I, I asked myself, I don't know why they did this, but it's great that they did put together this 3D model. So if you want to download your community district, as a 3DM file, as a, as a 3D model file, you can do that. So this is for Midtown, and as you zoom in, you can see there's the Empire State Building, and next to the Empire State Building is the Graduate Center. So this very anonymous looking building is this, uh, but a much lower resolution. And that was the starting point for me to, uh, that, was the, that was the starting point of putting together what could be a 3D model of this, because it doesn't exist. If you look on, for example, the main, website where you can download 3D models of anything is called thingify.com and you know you can download uh, you know like a cat or a fox or you know like uh, the Eiffel Tower or something like that but if you have a particular building that's not, not so well known that you want to have a 3D model for um, you may have to simply make it yourself um, and that so the, the open data was the starting point the creation of it in its final form which was look, looked like this um, needed more inputs, uh, not from open data sources, but from people who maintained like uh, hobbyist type blogs of classic buildings in New York City. So, some, so the, the original architectural renderings for this building that was built surely at the turn of the century, I don't actually remember, um, were, are not accessible, but what is accessible is somebody who put on the internet what they, what they had found of these original uh, architectural drawings. So using Google SketchUp, again, the free version, um, you can map these kinds of images onto a 3D model, the starting point of which was the open data, and then you can have the details from people who are sort of like fellow enthusiasts. So I have little models here which I can hand out. Um, in three different sizes, if you're interested, take a look at it. Um, the 3D printing, for those who are curious, is um, it's not new, obviously, it's not a groundbreaking technology, but it is nice because um, you can just use a hobbyist machine to print this, um, and it's not plastic, it's resin, it's like a form of starch, really. It's, um, it's very safe, it's very accessible type of material. Yeah. Which machine did you use? Uh, a, uh, an Ultimaker, I forget the brand. It's it's MakerBot. MakerBot, that, MakerBot Ultimaker 3, I think it's called. Um, these things are brown for a long time, you can get them second hand, um, and they're very cost efficient to use, they don't use very much material. Um, at all. And this was really, again, this was just a hobbyist's kind of approach to producing, uh, to reproducing a classic building. Uh, it used to be a shopping stash, a department store in, in the 1930s, I think it was. Um, and, uh, but, a, but a model of it doesn't exist now. It didn't exist yet until we were able to start with the open data and, and render it from there. So the second thing that uh, I created in this kind of vein of wanting to create models um, was what used to be called oblique maps. Any of us who've been around for you know a little longer uh, than the average bear knows that um, there used to be what the U.S. Geological Survey called um, oblique maps, where you produce a 3D uh, a, a drawing on, on paper, pen on paper um, in a 3D angle to to render um, a piece of natural landscape, a piece of piece of the U.S. So this is. Uh, it says in Cape Blanc of Oregon. Um, and these were really, in a way, the only way that you could take a look at a piece of land that you'd never been to and see what the relief looked like without reading it um, as, a, as a perfect top down um, with the lines that show elevation. So this is not NYC data, but I will show it to you anyway because I think it's nice. It's sort of like federal open data, if you like. Um, this is uh, the US Geological Survey's website where you can download. Um, map data for any part of the US. And um, what they do is they offer different kinds of maps that kind of patch together uh, studies of the landscapes over the course of the many decades and piece them together. Um, you can download um, sections of land as a raster image, um, basically meaning uh, a series of dots, not a vector image, but just a series of like a JPEG or a bitmap image. And from there, um, if you want to take a 2D image of a piece of land and turn it into a 3D model, um, there's a piece of open source software available for the R statistics uh, software program. 
uh, called Ray Shader. And this was developed a couple of years ago by a guy called Tyler Morgan Wall, um, where what you do is you take a, you take a bitmap image of, of a, piece of, a piece of land, turn it into a matrix, as you see on the top right there, where each piece of elevation is rendered with a number. And then, because those numbers show, uh, matrix shows a relation between the numbers, you can turn it into uh, a 3D rendering of that piece of land. You can add water, it shows here, which is just a single uh, layer, and you can, a single uh, opaque layer that you can raise or lower according to how high you want the waters to be. Um, and then render it in first in digital 3D, and then again you can print this in 3D, which I have. Unfortunately, one example here for that as well. Um, so it's very it's quite computationally demanding because it's your, you're rendering a very large, very detailed piece of land in, in, in 3D. Um, but it's really useful, of course, because you can then produce for yourself any part. If you have a map for something rendered as an image, you can turn it into a 3D model, and then you uh, you know you aren't relying, for example, on Google Earth, uh, which is proprietary um, and wouldn't allow you to download, for example, a particular segment if you wanted the Rocky Mountains for yourself to print at any size you want, this would be the way to do it. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. We've got, we've got four minutes. And, yeah. um, well, any questions for Sam? Thank you. This is really <laughs> um, So I guess just kind of closing it out, you know, like I said, there's a diverse way of people interacting with data that is degrees of open or not, you know, playing with and learning new digital skills. I hope this is inspirational and feels like people are very excited by the different kinds of things that we're doing. So I think hopefully we all feel more empowered to learn um, and aware that there are lots of different ways that people are learning um, and making and creating. And there's not like one right way to work with the data, um, right? It's always partial to some extent. There's always limitations, biases, errors. Um, there is an assumption that you know if something can be done by a computer, it must somehow be more objective or efficient. Uh, Meredith Rosar refers to that as techno chauvinism uh, and its very gendered origins of the origins of, of artificial intelligence science and computer science. Um, but you know, kind of take that in, think about it. Uh, the slides you can access here. I will also upload them into the schedule. Um, and we'll also make sure we get Rebecca's amazing syllabus. Um, so any last questions or Oh, okay. um, no, I was just thinking about how, you know, those of us who are sort of in the realm of using data may be drawn to doing this, but, you know, part of the interest of public interest is like, how do we allow like folks who may be contributors to the data to kind of see how their data is being used, but also help them, and I was just thinking about your project, like in terms of like the letter writers, is there a feedback loop to let the letter writers know like this is now, not, not as a criticism, but just sort of as an inspirational yeah. idea that they might then be able to become more aware of how their letters were then used to influence how we think about you know the process. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So for the project where I'm going to be analyzing discourse, I have to get what's called IRB approval. So getting um, approval from the research board at the that basically anything that involves human subjects has to be approved on an ethical level. Um, the truth is, I'm not going to be using anyone's names. Um, that's part of the, the ethical because I'm looking at broader trends by quality. But I do. I I have an agreement that people should should know that their their, their information is being used. Um, but um, it, at the same time, I don't have everyone's email address. So like there's it's like there's a complicated feedback feedback loop. But what I would hope um, is that the you know state district commission and other city agencies can make the research available and the data that I would that I'm using available I mean, is already available on our website to show how I used it um, when if the paper gets published. Well, I think we've got our flag, so thank you all so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, hope you have a wonderful rest.